The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. The shepherds went in haste to Bethlehem and found Mary and Joseph and the infant lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known the message that had been told them about this child. All who heard it were amazed by what had been told them by the shepherds. And Mary kept all these things, reflecting on them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as it had been told them when eight days were completed for his circumcision. He was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, here we are on this New Year's Day, January 1st, 2014. Hard to believe. And I'm sure some of you were up last night at the stroke of midnight and all that, as some of my altar servers were. And so some of the wiser of us went to bed earlier. But besides that point, when we think about it, what's really different today that was so different from yesterday? Not so much. So it's really not like we start this whole new year and like the past is totally forgotten in a sense. Granted, we have people that will look back and some will say, oh, that was a great year, 2013. Others will say, well, I'm glad that's in the rear view mirror. You know, don't want to relive 2013 again. But actually, we all know, no matter what year it is, no matter what transition we make on a page of a calendar, we will face blessings and also challenges. And we'll have all kinds of joyous moments and also moments of sorrow, too. That's life. So be it. But we as Christians aren't here to celebrate a chronological new year. We're here to celebrate something very spiritual actually the eighth day, the concluding day of the octave of Christmas. So our Christmas celebration just wasn't one 24-hour period of time. It's a whole octave that we have eight days of celebration. And actually, don't forget, the 12 days of Christmas concludes with the Feast of the Epiphany. So we aren't living under this rule, this constriction, of a chronological 24-hour period of time. Rather, we're living in the presence of God. And that's why in the gospel language Greek, we find two words for time, chronos, the chronological, past, present, future, yesterday, today, tomorrow, and kairos, God's ever-present time. We're called to live in the presence of God. And so for that reason, today on this eighth day of the octave, we give honor to Mary, the mother of our Savior, under the title Mother of God. It's very important for us to truly understand that title, which we do profess in the creed. But nevertheless, we have to always remember that Mary is the one who was chosen to be the mother of our Savior. She was the virgin, the one full of grace, free of all sin, even original sin, who received that message of the archangel Gabriel, who said yes, who conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and through her, Jesus Christ, second person of the Holy Trinity, true God, entered this world becoming true man. Mary did not create Jesus, no, he's the eternal second person of the Trinity. But Mary gave him his humanity. So yes, Mary gave birth to the divine person Jesus, true God and true man. Fundamental point 
of our faith. And we have, therefore, the opportunity this day to honor her as the mother of Jesus Christ, true God, therefore the mother of God, a title officially given to her at the Council of Ephesus in the year 431. Be that as it may, though, should we not look to Mary and see how we ought to live our life? In our gospel, we hear of how the shepherds came, and Mary treasured all these things in her heart. So she lived in the presence of God each day, whether it was a day of joy or a day of sorrow. Now, in our gospel, we also hear of a chronological event, and that is the circumcision. So eight days after birth, the Torah prescribed that the baby Jesus would be taken to the temple in Jerusalem, not far from Bethlehem, for that act of circumcision. This was a sign of the covenant. And so the covenant promise to Abraham was that males would receive this ritual. But with that, don't we see how Joseph and Mary bring little baby Jesus to the temple there in the presence of God? For the Jews, the inner part of the temple had the Ark of the Covenant. So within the Holy of Holies was the sacred Ark. And in that Ark was the ten com or were the Ten Commandments. A little bit of the manna from the Exodus. And then there was the priestly staff of Aaron. Well, put it all together. Jesus came into this world to make a new covenant. Here in that ritual of circumcision, his blood is spilt for the first time. Blood that foreshadows his spilling of blood on the cross. But here we see, too, who Christ is. For he is the word of God made flesh. So he fulfills the Ten Commandments, the whole word of God, and he is the true priest who will offer the sacrifice for our sins. He is the bread of life come down from heaven who will continue to nourish us, share his life with us through the gift of the Holy Eucharist. So this is what we see in this circumcision event. But then we could ask the question, who then fulfills the ark that contains all those things? Mary. Mary fulfills that role. She's the temple, the ark, who carried Jesus within her womb, gave birth to Jesus, and there we see on this eighth day then a beautiful foreshadowing of the whole plan of salvation. Well, with that in mind, you and I should remember too that just as Mary is the mother of our Savior, she's our mother. When our Blessed Mother stood at the foot of the cross as Jesus was offering that sacrifice for our sins. Jesus looked down and he saw St. John there, his apostle. He saw his blessed mother and he said to Mary, behold your son. And he said to St. John, behold your mother. Yes, he is entrusting his widowed mother to St. John because Jesus had no brothers and sisters to care for his mother. But we've always seen this also, that Mary has been given to us as our mother. Since, as St. Paul reminds us, we are the adopted sons and daughters of God through baptism, and Jesus is truly our Savior, can we not also say Mary is truly our mother? And that's what's important about today, too, that while we honor her role as mother, we also remember spiritually she's our mother who wants to keep us close to Christ, who does intercede for us in ways we don't even know, just as she did at the wedding feast of Cana. I always think of the beautiful message that our Blessed Mother gave to Juan Diego in 1531 when she appeared to him at that place we know as Guadalupe. And our Blessed Mother said this to Juan Diego, know for certain least of my sons that I am the perfect and perpetual Virgin Mary, mother of Jesus, the true God, through whom everything lives, the Lord of all things near and far, the master of heaven and earth. It is my earnest wish that a temple be built here to my honor. Here I will demonstrate, I will manifest, I will give all my love, my compassion, my help, and my protection to the people. 
I am your merciful mother, the merciful mother of all who live united in this land and of all mankind, of all those who love me, of those who cry to me, of those who seek me, and of those who have confidence in me. Here I will hear their weeping, their sorrow, and will remedy and alleviate all their multiple sufferings, necessities, and misfortunes. Let nothing discourage you, nothing depress you. Let nothing alter your heart or your countenance. Also, do not fear any illness or vexation, anxiety, or pain. Am I not here who am your mother? Are you not under my shadow and protection? Am I not your fountain of life? Are you not in the folds of my mantle, in the crossing of my arms? Is there anything else that you need? What a beautiful message. And that's what we should remember as we begin this chronological new year that we look to the example of our Blessed Mother, whom we honor this day as our own mother. Yes, the mother of Jesus, the mother of God, but the, our mother too. And so, my brothers and sisters, if there's one thing to do as we start this new year, it's something, a good resolution, to allow us to live in that presence of God each day. I'm sure some of you have made resolutions and if we look at statistics that I saw in the paper yesterday, about 8% of people actually keep their resolutions. A lot deal with weight loss and this and that, mostly bodily, material kinds of resolutions. Make a spiritual one, and that would be this. Say the rosary each day. Yes, say the rosary each day, whether you do so individually or as a family. How beautiful that would be. And here you moms, who usually do set the schedules for a home, why not you be the inspiration to say family, after dinner, we're going to say the rosary. Or if you have little ones and they're a little bit more rambunctious, at least a decade. And then you and husband can say the rosary together. Also, husband, step up to the plate, be a Saint Joseph, and you lead the rosary. How beautiful that would be. But in looking at those different sets of mysteries, whether it's the joyous, luminous, sorrowful, glorious mysteries, we're looking at the life of our Lord. And as Pope John Paul II said, we're looking at our Lord through the eyes of Mary, that woman of faith, the woman of grace, the woman who leads us to holiness. So wouldn't it be wonderful if we took that time each day, that 15 minutes, to unite as a family or as a husband and wife or individually to just pause and ponder these mysteries. In so doing, I guarantee you, the Holy Spirit will pour forth abundant graces to open your heart and know the friendship of Christ. Isn't that what we need each day of a year? Absolutely. Each day of a life? Absolutely. The Holy Spirit will open your hearts and allow a friendship to grow. Whether then we face joyous moments, or we face tough times, we'll know the presence of Christ. How beautiful that will be. So let us commit ourselves then to really making that good spiritual resolution of saying the rosary. And keep on striving for that. Don't say, oh, well, I missed it this day and cast it off. No, you do it. Or don't let other things complicate lives, whether, oh, I'm so busy, so much to do, don't have time, or I don't want to do this, whatever. No, do it. Make God the first priority and honor our Blessed Mother and pause to meditate on the life of Christ. Guaranteed, our time will change. Our lives will change. Pope Francis, in his recent exhortation, said this, contemplating Mary. We realize that she who praised God her Magnificat for bringing down the mighty from their thrones and sending the rich away empty is also the one who brings a homely warmth to our pursuit of justice. She is also the one who carefully keeps all these things, pondering them in her heart. Mary is able to recognize the traces of God's spirit in events great and small. She contemplates 
constantly the mystery of God in our world, in human history, and in our daily lives. She is the woman of prayer and work in Nazareth, and she is also Our Lady of Help, who sets out from her own town with haste to be of service to others. This interplay of justice and tenderness, of contemplation and concern for others, is what makes the ecclesial community look to Mary as a model of evangelization. And so, my brothers and sisters, if we want to make this truly a happy, holy, healthy, that includes spiritual, healthy new year, let us turn to the prayers and example of our Blessed Mother. Say the rosary. And yes, we will grow in our friendship of Christ. And guaranteed, so will our family. So will others. If only we turn to her. May God bless you.